Welcome to lesson three of chapter two on heat. My name is Kieran Mills and I teach uh, physics in the academy. Now I'm going to continue on uh, with another example, the last example in chapter two, example 10. And I'm also going to do something called the heat pump, uh, which is something that we call real life physics. The technical term for it is STS, Science, Technology and Society. And they want you to know the real life applications of what we're doing here. And this heat pump is actually a very, very important STS. They'd like you to know it in detail. Now, before I do that, let me get on to example 10. Example 10 is a nice question. It involves a lot of physics, a lot of simple basic physics that we're going to bring together. So it says a saucepan containing water is left boiling on a cooker in the kitchen for some time. As the water evaporates from the saucepan and then condenses, the temperature of the air in the kitchen is raised. So there's your saucepan, steam is coming off and the temperature of the air goes up. So in other words, energy is going from that steam changing state condensing into the air. Now it says given that the volume of the air in the kitchen is 20 meters cubed and the water is evaporating from the saucepan at a rate of 0.27 grams per second. So every second 0.72 grams of that water is turning into steam. What are they asking in part one? In part one they're asking the question the rate at which energy is transferred from the water in the saucepan by evaporation. You know, anytime we use that word, the rate, well, we normally mean per second. Anyway, I have the mass that's evaporating per second. We're talking about changing state. And if we're talking about changing state, obviously the formula I use will be E is equal to ML. Because we're talking about the rate, it's per second, which is perfect, because I have the mass per second here. The mass is in grams. Remember, you have to turn that into kilograms. Jump the decimal point, one, two, three to the left. So I get 0 0.00072. Multiplied by the latent heat of vaporization of steam, which is given. 2.3 by 10 to the power of 6. So put that into my calculator. And I get an answer of 1656. That's joules. And I suppose you can write down per second, because that's the rate. That's joules per second, s to the power of minus one. That's my first part. Next part of the question. The rise in temperature of the air caused by the evaporation and condensation in 10 minutes. Remember that's the energy going into the air every second. If you're talking about 10 minutes, well, I'm going to multiply that by 10 minutes in seconds. And also they say only 15% of the energy is transferred. So when that condenses, only 15% of it goes into the air in the kitchen. Where does the rest of it go to? I don't know, the walls or whatever. So here is, in part two, here is the energy absorbed by the air. Well, it's the energy per second, which is 1656. That's going on for 10 minutes. 60 seconds in a minute. 10 by 60, 600 seconds. And I'm only talking about 15% of it being transferred uh, to the air. So how do I get 15% of it? 
15 over 100, quick ray is 0.15. So that's the total energy that's absorbed by the air in the kitchen. So 1656 by 600 by 0.15. And I get 149,040 joules. So now the question is, they're asking me, what does the temperature of the air in the kitchen go up by? Well, we're back to the air here. Now, we're talking about air staying in the same state. So the formula I'm going to use for air will be mc delta theta. Now, mc delta theta, I need the mass of the air. They gave me the volume. Well, there's a constant given down there, uh, which is the density of air. I'm going to use a formula for that. Density, as you may know from your junior cert, is mass divided by volume. The symbol I use for density is rho. So rho is m divided by v. I've been given the volume of the air. So I want its mass. Mass is equal to rho multiplied by v. The density of air is given to me. The density of air is 1.2 kilograms per meters cubed. The volume is 20 meters cubed. Multiply 1.2 by 20 and I get 24 kilograms. You can see it's kilograms from the units. Now I have the mass of the air in the kitchen. So what is the energy gained by the air? Well, we know that's 149,040. My formula is E is equal to mc delta theta. They're asking me to find delta theta, which is the rise in the temperature of the air. So if I get the delta theta on its own, delta theta is E divided by m by c. That's my value for delta theta. What's the energy that went into the air in the kitchen? 149,040 joules. What's the mass of the air in question? We worked it out, didn't we, using our density formula? 24. And air has its own SHC. How much energy do I need to raise the temperature of one kilogram of air by one degree Celsius? And they have to give me that. That value is one by 10 to the power of 3. It's actually 1,000, isn't it? 10 to the power of 3. I could write down 1,000 or 1 by 10 to the power of 3. Makes no difference. That's delta theta. So put that into my calculator. I get delta theta is equal to say 6.21 degrees Celsius. That's the rise in temperature of the air. That's a nice little question. There's lots of simple physics in it involving density and percentages and so on. So I like that question. Now, we've done all the questions now. We've done all the examples from chapter two, but you need to practice. There's no point in that. Uh, there's no point in me just doing them. Those examples that I showed you are a type of example of nearly every type that you're going to encounter, but you need to practice yourself. So practice I call practice coursework, CW. And what you have to do is you should do the numerical problems in the notes. The numerical problems are on page 13 and there's a great variety of them. They start off nice and easy and then they get much more difficult. They get quite challenging towards the end. So you want to do from 1 to 19. You know, challenge yourself. Don't just watch a teacher doing them on the board. You have to get them into your head, into your long-term memory, 
So you need to practice them. You've got all the solutions available to you if you get stuck, but don't just look at the solutions too quickly. You now try and struggle with them for a while, and it's only when, uh, after a while, when I just simply can't do it, then I will look at the solutions. But then when you look at the solutions, you say, oh yeah, I should have got that. But put the work in yourself first. Now, the last part of this lesson, I want to do a very important application of physics called the heat pump. Now, in order to do that, there is a worksheet. So as you watch this video, you could be filling in this worksheet with me. You can download uh, the, uh, the worksheet from the website. So basically, I'm going to talk about that worksheet because the heat pump is quite complicated. Now, it's all explained in the notes, but it's nice to have some kind of visual representation of it. So let me talk about the heat pump. We start off at the top of your worksheet. You've got two bodies. You've got a hot body and you've got a cold body. There they are there. Now you know what the natural process is. Heat will flow from where it's hot to where it's cold. So that's natural. That heat will flow, in this case, from left to right. That's what we call natural. But inside your fridge, your freezer, you're going to do something else. You're going to take heat from inside the fridge or your freezer and make it colder. You're going to do something that's unnatural. You want to go in the other way. You want heat to flow from where it's cold inside the fridge to where it's hotter, the room where the fridge is. So you need a pump to make that happen. That won't happen naturally. So the heat pump will facilitate that process. Right, next part. Let's fill in these boxes. This here is a gas G, and this here is a liquid. Now, if I want to turn from a gas to a liquid, or vice versa, what does that involve? Change of state, that involves latent heat. So, when a liquid turns into a gas, you need to give it latent heat. On the other hand, just like we saw in the previous example, when the water from the saucepan condensed in the air, then it gave that latent heat back to the air. So, when a gas turns into a liquid, it gives off its latent heat. When a liquid turns into a gas, it needs latent heat to do that. So it's going to absorb latent heat from somewhere in order to make that happen. Now, when we turn liquid into gas, we normally do it by heating. But there is another way I could do it. I could just get my gas, molecules flying around the place at random, and actually squash them, physically squash them together. And when I squash them together, eventually they coalesce into a liquid. So that's one way I could do it. And the heat pump is going to do that. So I could get my gas, squash my gas, and the little molecules will turn into a liquid. Well, if that's the case, if I turn a gas into a liquid, I squeeze out its latent heat. I push it out. However, the second I take my foot off it, so when I'm squashing it, I'm holding it there, the second I let go, then it's going to turn back into a gas. So when the pressure is released, the liquid will turn into a gas. That's a change of state. And I need latent heat to accomplish that. So it sucks the heat in from its surroundings. It might be the inside of the freezer or whatever. So that's the process that we're talking about. Now, inside our heat pump, we're going to use a very special liquid, and that liquid is called Freon. Freon has two big properties. The first property is its boiling point is really low. I think it's about minus 30 degrees Celsius. So you have to get to something like minus 35 degrees Celsius before it turns into a liquid. So the boiling point, the BP, is minus 30 degrees Celsius. The 
The second thing about Freon is it has a very, very high SLH. So in other words, when it changes from a liquid to a gas, then it needs a huge amount of energy to accomplish, accomplish that. So it's got a very, very high SLH. They're the two properties of Freon. So now let me look at the structure of my heat pump. This is your fridge or your freezer. This is the panel at the back of your fridge. And this is the panel on the inside of your fridge or your freezer. And you have these pipes circulating from front to back, from outside to inside, one continuous pipe. Inside that, you are going to put in your special liquid gas called Freon. Now, how do I represent a liquid? I represent the liquid like that. How do I represent a vapor? Just dots like that. Now, when you let the Freon out loose, it's almost certainly going to be gas, isn't it? I mean, if its boiling point is minus 30, unless you're in the Arctic, uh, that's going to be a gas. So when I put my Freon into the pipes, it's a gas. Separate molecules like that buzzing around. But I have what's called a compressor here. In other words, I'm pushing the gas in one direction. That compressor keeps on pushing the gas in one direction. And down here I have something called a valve. That valve is like a one-way door. A one-way door that can be very difficult to open. So basically, here's my Freon. The compressor is pushing the Freon, more and more Freon in one direction. And it starts packing up behind that valve or door. And as it packs up, you are beginning to compress it. You are squashing it. So as the molecules here get more and more squashed, they begin to liquefy. So this is now turning into a liquid. It's got stuck behind that one-way door. So now it's turned into a liquid. Now what happens when I turn a gas into a liquid? Well, I squeeze the latent heat out of it. So the heat gets pushed out. Now that's at the back of the fridge. So if you put your hand on the back of the fridge, you will actually feel it being a little bit warmer. Now that's a one-way door. And eventually that one-way door is going to get pushed open. And when it gets pushed open, that liquid Freon is going to go spilling through. So here's the liquid coming through on the other side. Now it's no longer being squashed, if you like. It's now in open space. And when it's in open space, if you like, the pressure has been released. And what happens when that occurs? Well, it'll turn back into a gas. So it turns back into a gas. That liquid will turn back into gas molecules. And when a liquid turns back into a gas, I need latent heat to accomplish that. Where does it grab the latent heat from? Wherever it can. The inside of a freezer? You might say, well, there's no heat inside a freezer. There's always heat, unless you go down to absolute zero. So it'll grab the heat from inside the freezer, and therefore heat will get absorbed from the inside of the freezer. And as a result of that, the inside of your freezer will get colder. Now I think that's tricky. That's all explained in chapter two. And it is an application that they do like asking, but I do think it's tricky. And the worksheet is there to help you to understand it. So anyway, that's the end of lesson three. Thanks very much.